Hey folks, I'm Dr. Denbor. I am um, super excited to have you here. It's a privilege, thank you. I am tap tackling a topic that I, uh, I didn't know what I was getting into. We have talked plenty about detoxification and it's a very critical topic. But I've been witnessing a wave in almost 30 years of practice of general anxiety disorders in our kids. Behavioral disorders. Autism. When I graduated was one in 22,000 kids. Now it's one in 54. In fact, the principal was telling me last week, Monday, as he was looking at the seminar, the, the poster for it, and he was saying, you know, my school now has three full classrooms every day just for the autistic kids. It was four years before I saw my first autistic case. Now we get them every week. Diabetes. One out of three kids has diabetes as pre-diabetic. Obesity, you know it's gone through the roof. Autoimmune disease has more than quadrupled in those 30 years. And no one's really asking why. And that bugs me. Yes, we're doing great things in the classroom to help these damaged kids. Yes, we're trying to deal with the autoimmune diseases in different ways. But nobody's asking why. The final little dart that got me to do this seminar. You see, I've been avoiding it for a bit, simply because it's such a huge topic. Where do you start? And what you're going to get tonight in about 45 minutes to an hour, it really should take 10 hours. So fasten your seatbelts. We're going <laughs> to, yeah. But I was, I was watching this summer, this lovely young couple with this cute little baby getting ready to go outside. And they were just slathering this poor baby with the sunscreen lotion. Just everywhere. This poor baby was white, even between the toes. I watched them get it in between their toes. And I was thinking, oh, all those phthalates that are going into this kid's system, within 20 seconds it gets absorbed and it dumps down the IQ by six to eight points over time. We're wrecking this brain just with that suntan lotion, let alone the vitamin D deficiency that will result. You see, these are well-meaning parents, weren't they? I don't blame them. But there's a lot of lack of information out there. Let's change that. So we're going to be talking a lot about some very complex issues. We can do questions at the end. I do have to be out of here by 7.45. I have another lecture to attend. Um, that is on genetics, which we'll talk about next year at some point. You'll, uh, you'll love that one. But Tonight, it's toxicity on you. So there's three kinds of toxins, environmental, endogenous, and toxins of choice. Okay, the environmental toxins are the primary drivers of disease today. It's my statement, but I believe it very, very powerfully. Yes, there's problems with lead. Yes, there's problem. I can go on and on and on. Exhaust fumes, right? They all have a huge impact. But environmental toxins on food, I want to qualify it even further, is a driver of, I believe, 50 to 60 percent of disease today. So we're going to be focusing on environmental. When I was prepping for this seminar, I, I thought, you know, the endogenous that's a whole other topic altogether. That's where we have yeast and other bacterial overgrowth within, and we actually produce toxins within. Okay, so that's, that's a whole other topic. That's microbiome change, it's leaky gut syndrome, it's yeast overgrowth, it's parasites, it's all those things. And yes, that is a very powerful driver of disease also, but it's often secondary to environmental problems, often. Also, things like antibiotics and many medications. Toxins of choice, that's kind of self-explanatory, right? There's a lot, of, um, a lot of things out there that we can toxify ourselves with. And uh, again, that's another toxin. But for some of us, the opioid epidemic that's going out there, it's a very tragic thing. 
Um, for some people, that was a toxin of choice. For others, obviously, they got torn into this. So I started heading some toxic effects. And these are the more prominent ones out there. The autism, the male birth defects. This one's become real prominent. And the childhood asthmas. I've watched that one just absolutely explode. And I just for kicks thought I'd compare it with the asthma in my home country, the Netherlands. We are fourfold ahead of them, even though they have this wet, cold, damp climate. Yeah. Your, uh, your lymphocytic leukemias, your uh, childhood brain cancers, where does this little three-year-old get come in with brain cancer? We see so many of them here. Absolutely tragic. Where does that come from? Preterm births, pediatric general anxiety disorders, Time Magazine just had this huge on the cover, just that it has become so prominent. Infertility. Infertility is becoming a real problem. Partially, the males are also responsible. Usually, the focus is on females. That's one of my pet peeves. The male has just as much to do with it as the female. And sperm count in the male today is declining by 1% every year. This has been going on for the last 50 years. So, diabetes is absolutely uh, exploding on the scene. We used to blame too much sugar, and sugar is still a big problem. I don't want to not focus on sugar, but folks, it's not just about sugar at all. At all. Cardiovascular disease, behavioral disorders, and cancers. So are you toxic? It's no longer a question for toxic. The real question is, how toxic are we? So toxic burden. It's a total accumulation of toxins that the body's dealing with. These toxins come from a variety of sources, but initial exposure actually begins with the baby still in the womb. 20% of mom's toxins that she has accumulated over her lifetime gets dumped into the fetus. Another very unfortunate fact, PCBs, which is a real wicked toxin, mom's concentration of PCBs goes down by 40% if she breastfeeds for 12 months. Good for mom, but not so good for someone else. So these are real wake-up statistics that we're just starting to find out about. Part of what we're seeing in today's society is the accumulation of great-grandmother's toxins dumped into grandmother, grand dumped into our mother, right, and then dumped into us, and so forth. So we've got this gradual accumulation of toxins within, causing genetic changes and this incredible onset of chronic disease. So last time that we checked umbilical cord blood, 287 chemicals were detected. I suspect it's a lot more than that. We just don't know how to, how to check them all. And we don't know what they all do. But 180 of those 287 chemicals are found to cause cancer in humans or animal. 217 are toxic to the brain and nervous system, which is, again, why we see so many neurological issues. And birth defects. These toxins, they're in all of us. The CDC picked six of what they consider the most common toxic ones. I don't necessarily agree with the list, but it's a pretty good list to start with. So let's start with that. Your PDEs, flame retardants, your car seat, your car dash, your mattress, your furniture, building materials. You're not allowed to build without these. It's everywhere. Okay, affects the nervous system, liver and kidneys, sexual dysfunction, especially thyroid and brain disorders. How many people do you know are on thyroid medication now? 50% of women at 50 have thyroid issues of some kind. This, by the way, is also one of the main chemicals behind the obesity problem that's haunting us today. In a way, this seminar that we're doing right now is a precursor to our weight loss seminar that we do every January, where we'll jump out and do something a little different. BPA, 
We've all heard about BPA, right? It's found in plastics, and that's why we have to really watch what we drink in. For example, that little plastic thing that goes on top of the coffee or tea that you've bought. So in here we have the hot steam going up against it, and BPA is just nicely dribbling down into your drink, contaminating you, right? BPA is very commonly found in straws as well. When you drink a drink with a straw, you're getting phenomenal amounts of BPA. That little receipt that you get out of the gas station, loaded with BPA. We can't avoid it. As soon as it touches the skin or is in the mouth, it's within our system within 20 seconds. And the really depressing thing is we get to toxic levels with just two cans of soup a week. Even the paper, the paper uh, containers for soy milk, we're talking organic soy milk with a so-called BPA alternative, gets into our system with just one of those canisters per week at toxic levels, above the allowable. So what have the manufacturers done? They've come up with different PBAs. They've got, come up with PBC and PBD and PBI, and we think, well, yeah, there's no PBA in it. We don't know what those chemicals do. We just don't know. There's no way we can test them all. So your PFOAs, non-stick cookware. Okay. Stain resistance. Okay. This one is one of the main ones behind infertility. Infertility has become a big part of DBC. We see a lot of them, and it's amazing what you can do just by cleaning up a patient. It's absolutely amazing. Acrylamide. This is an interesting one. When you fry your foods, you create this byproduct. If you put some delicious food on the grill, and you get those nice char marks. That's what this is. And yes, french fries. America's favorite food. Man, am I a downer or what? <laughs> yeah? French fries is a very powerful study where if a kid eats french fries twice a week, the first five years of life, we're talking woman, uh, girls now, their chance of contracting breast cancer has more than doubled for life. Amazing, right? Absolutely amazing. Mercury, we've all heard about mercury. The reason it's so wicked, its damage is very permanent. And it causes genetic SNPs to be passed on to the next generation and is measurable for six generations, this damage. <coughs> six generations. That's why mercury is so wicked. This is a gasoline additive. We got rid of it back in the late 70s. It's still around. It's not going away. And it causes a lot of problems. This only describes six compounds. So the worst toxins. I thought, I'm going to go through it all and see where the research lies. And mind you, the research we have is still very limited compared to the amount of chemicals that are out there. We think we know a lot. We don't. The worst one, and, and this is not in order of, of what I think is worse. This is just the bunch that I think are the worst ones. But Roundup has got to be close to the top of the list. It's made illegal in Europe for a very good reason. The stuff causes permanent changes in your microbiome and is extremely carcinogenic and can cause neurological signs and symptoms. But then the manufacturers of Roundup will say, well, look at our clinical trials. So they take glycophosate and they test it on animals and humans. And by the way, all my data that I use is human data. And say, well, it's not really not so bad. It's, you can't say it's good for you. I wouldn't ingest it, but it's not that bad. However, if you look at what Roundup really is, this is the active ingredient. And then you have inert petroleum ingredients with it. Sounds pretty innocuous. It's, just, ah, it's not that bad. It's not that bad at all. It is, though, because when you combine inert petroleum ingredients with glycophosphates, 
you just increase its toxicity 1,000 fold. And folks, that's not how it's studied. Because we use active ingredients all the time, that's what we study, but they sneakily have added that to it. Now all of a sudden we've got an incredibly toxic substance. They say it's gone in 24 to 36 hours in the soil. Mm -mm. It's affecting the, micro micro the microbes within the soil three years later yet. Residues are still measurable five years later. If you walk through it, and it's hard to avoid it, right? It's everywhere. And then you just walk into your home, the dust goes on the ground. Guess where the little ones are? They're crawling on the ground, aren't they? And they are picking that up, and they are really getting a huge dose of it. I had this absolutely incredibly brilliant idea to put white tile in my house. <laughs> well, guess who's vacuuming it every day? <laughs> yeah? But I am absolutely amazed, even when we take our shoes off, although the occasional person doesn't, how it just accumulates dust. It is unbelievable. It is unbelievable. It's out there. And the babies are crawling through that. The pets are in there. We're exposed to that. Just that. Who would have thunk? Arsenic. A lot of doctors consider this the number one problem, believe it or not. 25% of wells, including municipal wells, have over twice the allowable limits of arsenic. Arsenic is sneaky. It's very much a neurotoxin and damages the liver and the kidneys and may be responsible for a lot of our neurological deficits that we're seeing. Phthalates, PBDE, mercury, lead, PCBs. Let's go through them. <coughs> Arsenic, heart, stroke, lung cancers. Lung cancer being big, by the way. Did you know smoking is only responsible for half the lung cancers out there? Yeah, arsenic actually is a big one as far as causing lung cancers. 25% of us have this problem. Mercury. Amalgams. Now here's a controversial one, correct? Silver amalgams are quietly going away. No, they never caused a problem, but hmm, we're not going to use them anymore. But a lot of traditional <coughs> dentists are still using them because that's what they learned in school. 10 micrograms per day is what we secrete. It's way above the allowable limits for mercury into our system. If you happen to drink lemon juice, you just doubled it. Anything acidic, tomato. So it's one per filling. Fish, about two and a half per day. Water, about 0.3. And even that is not an acceptable limit. And yes, vaccinations. It's still being used as a preservative and if that one's not being used as a preservative then other heavy metals are aluminum being a fairly common one and it's way above the allowable limit it is way above the allowable limit notice how mercury deposition is way in a red zone right through here notice how it follows the pattern of our mountains there why would you think that is China. Prevailing winds from China, it all gets dumped by us, including these mountains right through here. Right? That's all China. And then look at where Grand Rapids is. We're in the red. Now, why would we be in the red? I'm not going to blame everything on China, although it's definitely part of the equation. <laughs> but what I can tell you is that Coal plants, yes, in Chicago, right? We've, we're all the, uh, the iron manufacturing, they're still fired by coal there. Especially Gary, Indiana. But Muskegon throws a lot up in the air, tons of it. Tons of it every year. Because to make cement, and there's some big cement plants there, mercury is one of the big byproducts that gets spewed out into the air. So we have ourselves quite a mercury problem in this, in this state. We do have a metal analysis here, and we see it quite frequently in behavioral problems. PFCs. This has been making the news, hasn't it? A lot. Developmental neurotoxicants associated with ADHD. 
what I was surprised to find how slowly it gets eliminated. Okay, the half-life means that's how long it obviously takes to get rid of half of it. At best, two years, and at worst, 8.5 years. So it's there for a long time. It's there for a long time. It's very much neurological. I've also found some evidence for liver and kidney cancers and definitely associated with behavioral disorders. Anytime you see the word ADHD, think all the general anxiety disorders, depressions, just cognitive decline, that kind of thing. What's the source of that one? That's, I'll, I'll get into that. Oh, okay. So phthalates, it's found in personal cosmetics. Okay, this is a real powerful one. Note whenever you see fragrance, and how often have you seen fragrance on labels? Phthalates. It goes into your system so quickly, so quickly. And it causes so much change genetically. Your genetic expression just gets changed by that. And yes, it's found in nutritional supplements very commonly. There's so many unethical companies out there that just sneak these things in to make it more visually appealing or more slippery. Pharmaceuticals very often have it. Yeah. And a lot of toys. I was shocked by how many toys. It's to the point now that even Whole Foods, you walk into Whole Foods, they actually have a whole section for toys because they're safe. Whole Foods selling toys because they know that it's a problem. Okay. So phthalates affects your hormones a lot. Prenatal exposure equals brain issues. One of our main thyroid disruptors and is probably the primary driver of obesity today. I'm going out on a limb here, but it actually connects to insulin receptor sites. So insulin doesn't work anymore. Remember, one out of three of our kids have this problem, pre-diabetic or diabetic. I am seeing adult onset diabetes in kids now because of this. We're seeing a lot of differences with developmental hormones, don't we? The maturity of our kids is happening so much earlier. It is happening so much earlier. Here's your flame retardant, PBDE. This is the one that we've definitely been able to link to an IQ de decline of between 4 and 6.7 points. That's very significant, by the way. I used to think, you know, is it just my receding hairline or is, uh, is, 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 is a real cognitive decline even across the board? I'm not talking about just the elderly. And then I was chalking it up to, well, maybe it's all the screen time. And then, well, maybe the schools have changed the way they taught things. You know, there's all these things, bad diets. But no, it's actually measurable and it's scary. There is a real IQ decline occurring in the new generation. The reason it contributes to obesity, it contributes to the metabolic abnormalities, and it is stored in fat. This is why weight loss can be so, so difficult because it's become a storage site for PBDEs and other chemicals, and the body says, nope, I'm not letting that go, it's way too dangerous. It literally kicks it in. The one thing that I found, and this is very recent research from just a couple of months ago, was that it causes changes within our genes which makes it much more prone for us to father birth autistic kids or kids that are prone to getting autism. And yes, we're blaming it on this insult or that insult. It could have been a, uh, four rounds of antibiotics in a row. It could have been a vaccination. It could have been, I can go on and on and on and on. That triggered the autism, but that's only the final trigger in this whole chain of events. Very often, PBDE is in the background as well. Very often. So parents of autistic children share similar metabolic deficits and methylation capacity, include a thione dependent antioxidant detoxification capacity observed in many autistic children. Joe Pizzorno. Joe Pizzorno 
is the father of naturopathy here in the States. He set up some incredibly good schools. He is uh, author of uh, some very major medical journals and he, um, he's just a brilliant guy. And what he's saying is that the parents of autistic kids have a decrease in methylation capacity. Now what is methylation? You've heard me talk about it a few times. Methylation is just extremely difficult to to really get your hands around, but if you look at it as a whole bunch of series of on and off switches, and a methyl group can come on and turn something on or off. So that means neurotransmitters, hormones, our ability to fight inflammation, okay, on and on and on. DNA repair, a big one. So when that goes off, the whole body system goes off balance, right? The hormones, how you digest things, how we detoxify things, how we turn neurotransmitters on, and that is a genetic thing that you can be deficient in. And the glutathione dependent antioxidant detoxification capacity, I want you to really take a note of that word glutathione. That is the primary molecule for detoxifying all these chemicals. We're going to talk about that. It is the king or queen of detoxification, glutathione. So what can you do? Create awareness, it's part of why we're, what we're doing right now, correct? Reduce your exposure and detox your body. We're going to talk about each of those. Awareness. For example, did you know that farmed fish is one of the worst foods you can eat? It is. If you look at how the water is that these fish swim in, right? They're in tightly confined pools, maybe twice the size of this room and there's maybe this much space between fish. They can barely move. It is filthy, icky water that is loaded with chemicals because the food that they get fed is the equivalent of cows in a stockyard, just chemical laden, pesticide laden, lots of heavy metals, and so many antibiotics in there because there's so much disease breeding in these waters. In fact, the flesh of these fish is just kind of an icky grayish color that they have to put food colors into the food in order for them to get a more natural look. It is really too bad. Now, there are a couple of exceptions. If you go to the uh, website from Whole Foods, then you'll see that there's a few farms that actually do it ecologically soundly, as naturally as possible. I'm not gonna say they're as good as the real thing, but they at least approximate it. So it is possible to do, but it is of course economically more expensive to do it that way. But that little bit extra that you pay, so worth it. Concentrated soy, conventional veggies like kale, are toxin concentrators. So these are the plants that just soak it up like mad. So kale, obviously we're in a kale craze. It's a beautiful, beautiful leafy vegetable that does wonderful things for our detoxifying ability. However, because it makes us so good at detoxifying, it itself is a magnet for whatever gets sprayed on it. So therefore, conventionally raised kale is considered the highest toxic vegetable we could eat when it's grown conventionally. Kind of important to know, huh? Again, another reason to grow your own food. Another one that I'm just picturing, I saw a picture during my research of potatoes being harvested, and I took note because that's what my uncles did. And I, it just struck me, I, I still see my Oma Hans, every time we would go visit the farm, the family farm, he would just get one of those, those brown bags and he would be digging there and then give us the bag, right? And then of course I was the one that had to wash these things. Um, but, but these are just huge machines, big industrial machines just digging it up automatically and then they have to transport it in a covered truck because of all the fumes these things are emitting to a great area that looks like a football stadium. It's that big. And the pile of potatoes is just higher than tall buildings. And it just has to sit there and get rid of the fumes for the next three, four weeks. There are signs around warning that you can't go in that area. Those are the potatoes we eat. It's unbelievable. It is absolutely unbelievable. Yes, it's worth that little bit extra to buy organic. So your phthalates, 
with its IQ problem. The BPA, that one container of soy or two soup cans per week equals doubling the risk of diabetes. Doubling is a lot because it's quite prevalent. And PCBs decreased 40% in mom in 12 months of breastfeeding. Roundup is especially concentrated in genetically modified crops, including corn, soy, canola, alfalfa, and sugar beets. Okay, these genetically modified foods are genetically modified to resist to, so they can survive Roundup. Right? So now we've got this, this stuff that kills weeds and we can just spray it on and not worry about killing the crop. That's really what a GMO food is. However, we now know that this stuff alters our microbiome, just like I said earlier. And one thing I didn't say, but is also very important, these bacteria are so irrevocably changed in our gut that they themselves start producing Roundup in our gut. Again, it's a new finding. So how do you reduce your exposure? Use chemical-free products. Watch those dryer sheets. Take off your shoes before entering the house. You can do what I do, put in some white tile. That'll get you cleaned up. <laughs> reduce chlorine exposure. Avoid the personal products with phthalates, paraben, and 4-MBC. Those are the big ones. The list could go on and on and on. I could just, on that last one, spend hours. Food and drink. 90% of our toxin exposure to certain chemicals such as PCBs and dioxins actually come from the food we eat. 35% of all the food we purchase in the US supermarkets have measurable pesticide residues which make their way into our body. Okay. And 70% of our fruits and vegetable samples tested had a positive hit on that. When you buy organic, you're still getting it, by the way. You're just getting a lot less of it. It is not pesticide free. It is not chemical residue free. Not by any means. It's just a lot less. So, avoid the dirty 12. This is updated for this year. These are the ones that you definitely want to buy organic. The Clean 15 happen to be detoxifying and often don't require nearly as many pesticides and therefore are safer to eat if you buy conventional. Is organic better? Of course. Just nutrient-wise, you're doubling or tripling the amount of nutrients in organic. And you're getting a lot more trace minerals. We're just saying, hey, pay really close attention to that one. You can get this at the website of EWG. Food and drink. So, free range. Hormone, antibiotic free. Dairy, meat, eggs. All natural is not that. Okay, that's a very common abused term. Wild caught fish. Wash all produce very well before eating. Phthalates found in large majority of plastic packaging can leach into the foods that you eat. I have some plastic containers at home. I am not living in a cave. However, I never ever heat with them. And I only use it in the fridge to store some things. And it's mostly glass. It's mostly glass, but there happens to be a few plastic things there. At colder temperature, you have a lot less leaching of these phthalates. So what else can you do? Detoxify. So you detoxify using foods, nutraceuticals, or reduce toxin exposure. So I was sitting here, just kind of wrapping it up on Saturday afternoon, going through some of the research, and rejecting most of it, because a lot of it is just all in biochemistry and extremely boring, and everybody will be sleeping by now. Um, and I thought, you know, I think I can just gel it together into what's called a 3R program. 
You know, there's a four hour program for detoxification of the gut, right? And that's been around since the late 1980s. And Dr. Jeffrey Bland, my mentor, came up with that one. I said, well, what about a simplified version of three R program? So you remove, you re-nourish, you regenerate. It fits all chronic inflammatory conditions and diseases, all of them. Whether behavioral and cognitive, autoimmune, inflammatory, multi-system disorders. So again, remove the toxin. Avoid it from coming in. Because of all the damage it has done, you re-nourish the patient. You give it the proper nutrients. Put back in what was lost. And then finally, sit back and watch the regeneration phase. Things come back and it's surprising. A patient is sitting here that just told me uh, tonight that says, you know, my, my ligaments and tendons, they're becoming more elastic. They're coming back. And this is so long after the fact of going on a program that we call boot camp where we put a patient in an anti-inflammatory state, they go into a removal phase, right? We re nourish them with proper nutrients and now the regeneration just keeps on happening and happening. It's a really fun thing to watch. You just gotta make sure that lifestyle keeps fueling it the right way. So how do you remove? So there's, one of my main frustrations was that I never was able to actually sit down for an hour with a patient or a half hour with a patient or whatever it took or multiple sessions like that and really, really teach them what they need to be taught. And if, if you know it yourself, you just almost automatically, wrongfully assume, well, it's easy, just throw this and this and this on your plate and you just do it. Not recognizing the fact that change is hard, especially when it comes to food. It's really, really hard. Once you're there, yeah, then you're in a groove. I get that. And so we started uh, years ago, years ago, uh, creating different programs, and we have dozens and dozens of them. But these are some of the ones that most commonly are used to get patients well. Anti-inflammatory food plan takes away all the inflammatory foods that add to the burden of inflammation that pesticides and heavy metals and such have given. Or boot camp, which is our program that's longer and there needs to be lots of layers gotten through. Because remember, everything works in systems. And it, yes, for those that need to lose weight, lose weight. Yes, for those that need to normalize blood pressure and cholesterol, that usually happens within six weeks. And yes, those that need to get rid of autoimmune diseases, very measurable progress is made with that. Most autoimmune diseases, by the way, are very curable. The symptom management that our healthcare system is doing today is for the birds, as far as I'm concerned. Because now we're using toxins on a already toxic body in order to try to control symptoms, and then we have to take another toxin to control those side effects, and it just becomes this whole cycle that the poor patient is in. Good for crisis management. Good for crisis management. Not good for restoring health. And so that's what boot camp does. It just tries to reboot the patient. The 10, to 20, 20, 10 or 28 day uh, DBC detox just again takes away all the inflammatory foods and we add a nutraceutical uh, medical food uh, to assist the detoxification pathways. We upregulate the kidney function by an average of 87% research within 36 hours with that. Nourish is our ketogenic program. So we, instead of burning carbs with lots of inflammatory side effects, we turn more to fats and proteins with good phytonutrients from vegetables and a few fruits in order to accomplish fat burning instead of carbohydrate burning, which again is like a spewing exhaust out of an 18-wheeler, which yeah, it goes forward, but my, it takes a lot of effort and there's a lot of pollutants being, being expelled versus say an electric Tesla that with hardly any pollutants. Right? I want you guys to be a Teslas. That's Nourish. And then coming up next year, Fast Nourish. Fast Nourish, I will unleash in our seminar in January, but it's a new research that was published this, this, this year. I was privy to hear it before publishing. 
and it tells you how to get your stem cells to gather in concentrated bunches so it can fix what's wrong with you. So if you have rheumatoid arthritis that has damaged your knees, it can go to work there. If you have adult onset diabetes that has destroyed your pancreas and you've lost all hope of ever being off of insulin, using this program, they've gotten patients off of insulin because the pancreas came back. Absolutely shocking. MS, you see regeneration of nerves, of nerves that are gone. Yeah, stem cells are amazing and we're going to cover that in January. I'm really looking forward to it and still playing and, and, and getting it into more manageable program that actually is doable as far as teaching goes. So, so that's all exciting and it never, it never stops, you know that. So the renourished part, very critical. And I get this one a lot from patients. Well, Doc, if I eat good food, I should be able to get well, correct? Unfortunately, no. The nutrient density of our food has gone down about 60% in the last 50 years, and that's for organic food. We're dealing with depleted soil, and we're also dealing with very stressed bodies that are under such chemical attack that you need super amounts of certain nutrients in order to reverse it and then you can rely more on food. An extreme example is schizophrenia. We see uh, quite a large number of schizophrenia in this office. Schizophrenia can be treated very successfully by taking your B vitamins in certain ratio up to a thousand to ten thousand times the RDA. Established in the 1950s by Dr. Hoffer, Abram Hoffer, full name, and he did some wonderful research on that. So it takes a lot to reverse something. Once you're doing good, then you back off. So you take the nutraceuticals to renourish glutathione. There's that in word again. Okay, and what we use is something called Gluticlear. It triples glutathione levels within a week, to the point that sometimes we have to back off because the patient's starting to detoxify too much. That's glued to clear. Renourish the methylation. Remember, that's that on off switch. That's a very genetic thing. And we use something called methyl care, which is a, the B vitamins in certain ratios because that's what drives methylation. We renourish metallothionine. This is the one that affects heavy metals. When I was going to school, never heard of it. Didn't hear about it till at least 15 years ago. We now know this is the molecule that grabs a hold of, yes, even lead, yes, mercury, and can excrete it. We can excrete mercury at 87%, no, mis misquote there, 93% 93, 93 higher in 24 hours just by using metalloclear. You read nervous and nervous system with neuro support. This is a medical food for detoxifying the brain and to create less inflammation there. Your detoxification pathways is ultra clear with new, and your kidneys is Renogen. Renogen uh, doubles kidney function within one week, and we've seen patients come off of kidney dialysis with this. Renourish prenatal status. This is a really important one. I like to always get up on stage on this one because when, whenever we are thinking of having kids, it's really, really important for men and women to get themselves in a good state because we are passing on this genetic legacy that is measurable for generations and generations long after we're gone. As far as the genetics goes, the guy is responsible for about 30% of that. So guys do not escape. For example, if dad is an alcoholic at the time of conception, just one nutrient that I can choose, zinc. Zinc deficiency is measurable for the next six generations. It's shocking, and that's just one mineral. I can go on and on and on. So this is pretty important, folks. We know that we can change the transmission of abnormal genes. So let's say ALS or MS or Parkinson's runs in a family and is very prevalent. <coughs> then what we can do is we can give you certain methylating B vitamins, certain fats, and you stop the transmission of that gene. And you can also stop the transmission of the pesticide stores in, in a woman's body. 
you can actually stop that. And that's with something that's a prenatal called Optivoman. This is the one that when, once I put someone on it, they often remain even after pregnancy because they don't want to, uh, they feel so good on it. So there is a lot you could do. This has also been proven to increase baby's IQ by an average of six to eight points. Renourish your microbiome. I can't spend enough time on that. The microbiome is 80% of your immune system. It is 50% of hormone regulation. It houses 93% or is responsible for 93% of serotonin levels alone, brain neurotransmitter, right? This is absolutely huge. So your microbiome is uh, so big, we have 10 times as many bacteria in the gut as we have cells in our body. We're barely human, we're basically controlled by bacteria. And re mitochondria, I put that one last, because I know by now you're about half asleep. But mitochondria is our energy producer, it's our battery pack, it's what causes us to be able to recuperate from everything and anything. This is what drives the superhumans, as far as athletes goes, to do incredible things. But it's also what drives our brain to have a fast processing speed. If you can re-nourish the mitochondria, an 85-year-old gentleman or a woman can go back to the IQ they had when they were in their 20s and better. And that's been proven in research. It is amazing what you can do. This cognitive decline that you see and that is accepted as normal is not normal. It's an accumulation of toxins and it's really hurting the brain. It is amazing what you can do. Regeneration phase. Engage in permanent lifestyle change that minimizes toxic exposure. That's number one. And regenerates that which was lost. So that means for some people you have to hit it from a musculoskeletal aspect, right? If there's loss of muscle mass, hit the weights, do some interval training, can be done at any age. Hormone rebalancing. Did you know that 20% of Alzheimer's is really due to hormonal deprivation? It's amazing. New patient two weeks ago had acute onset of Alzheimer's and said, by the way, I also have prostate cancer. I said, oh, I bet you they put you on those shots, didn't they? He goes, yeah. So these are the shots that block hormones so that the prostate cancer doesn't spread. And that's when his symptoms started. His hormones just went down. Yeah, unwanted side effects of hormonal changes. Neurological, digestive, detoxification pathways, mitochondrial pathways, get enough rest, stress processing. And what we don't, what we really, really have to remember is patience. This accumulated slowly over time. It's not just going to go away. I have seen some studies that just increasing fiber, reducing toxic exposure, and going on a more vegetarian diet, so lots of good phytonutrients alone, can also take pesticides out. It takes a lot longer, but it does work. I've seen some pretty cool studies on that. But patience, that is a biggie. So, let's thrive, not just survive. And I feel very, very strongly that everything that we buy into and that consider at the new normal is not normal, right? We have little 12-year-olds that are actually old. And then I have patients in their late 90s that I'm treating for the silliest things which involved doing irresponsible things like some exercise trick that they were showing to someone. Had a 95 year old in actually that was, came in last week, had really injured his shoulder because he was teaching some other, you said they were just 70 years old, Doc, I thought they could do it. And he was showing them a new exercise and then of course hurt himself because he was showing off. <laughs> love it, I absolutely love it. So let's thrive, not just survive. So, I was privileged here to ski this, um, this spring, and when I was doing that, I was thinking, so a lot of people look at what we do and say, you're missing out. No, I think they're missing out. I really do. So part of that is protecting yourself, doing the things that your body can thrive on, so you're not just surviving, but thriving. Okay.
Big topic next time. Dr. Cage teaching this one? I believe, yeah? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And obviously we're seeing an epidemic of breast cancer and it's very related to this topic. She'll be mentioning some of those things, but also treatment protocols and what you can all do. So that's uh, next topic. And um, weight loss revolution will be uh, in January. Okay. I have a little bit of time for questions. Any questions? Yes. Your SPM active video game changer. Yeah. Help with the, the toxins? Very. Yeah. Anytime you reduce inflammation, you're reducing the load that the body is under and you're accelerating the detoxification processes. Because whenever you're inflamed, your body's just struggling to survive. The kidneys are getting rid of inflammatory molecules, the liver, right? And all of your detoxification pathways. Uh, you're also upregulating mitochondrial function, the energy production. And um, so SPM is absolutely worthy of another whole um, topic. Uh, so the question was on SPM Active, uh, for which a Nobel Prize is being uh, uh, granted next year. And it comes from Harvard. And there's this brilliant researcher, Dr. Hans. Um, uh, Dr. Hans, what, what he did is he figured out what's missing in patients who are chronically inflamed and he found that resolvents go down and we run out of ammunition to fight chronic inflammation, which is why MS and Parkinson's and Alzheimer's and diabetes and all these autoimmune diseases just have a, get a life of their own and are not curable. So he, he, had, he, was, isolated, he was able to isolate this com compound and that's what Omega Genics SPM is over here and it's definitely been revolutionary for my chronically inflamed patients. Um, even some things like, uh, I had a very severe case of uh, dry eye syndrome come in today and, and said, well, what's dry eye syndrome doing in an office like this, right? Well, remember, everything's connected and uh, dry eye syndrome is starting to be recognized as an autoimmune disorder. So guess what I'm putting them on? Omegagenics SPM along with anti-inflammatory or food, food plan um, that, um, that, yeah, I, I, there's so many there's so many things that, that I can talk about. It's just, there's no end to it. Yes. Um, the EWG. EWG. Environmental Working, who is that? So EWG, it's, it's, it's a group that, that focuses on the pesticides and all the chemicals. Um, and uh, it, it's, it's kind of like a watchdog that tests products. So if you want to see the quality of your essential oil or if you want to see a quality of your of your makeup, uh, they, they put a ranking scale on it. And it's really nice because, um, frankly, we don't have, we can't find information on everything all the time either. So we at least have that as a backup system and they seem to really be very well respected. And I'm really happy that they're there because in, in the makeup world alone, um, we have outlawed uh, so many of the chemicals that we use over here in Europe. Uh, in fact, we think that in the makeup industry alone, uh, Lexi, you had that quote. Do you remember that, how many chemicals? So it's approximately 3,000 chemicals they don't allow over there that we do allow here. Just think about it, 3,000 chemicals. It's, yeah. So EWG checks on that, yes. Did you come across anything in your studies about how clothing, toxic our clothing is? We have so much that's being... Yeah. That was another thing that prompted. Um, so we, you, you know the whole Wolverine debacle, right? And with their... Uh, with their stain resistant chemicals uh, that are now leaching into our wells and causing definite problems. And so I'm, I'm getting a lot of questions on that. And that was another push in the direction for me to do the seminar because as I was walking along, that was uh, late summer, uh, here I am with my sweaty bare feet in Wolverine shoes. And I thought, you know, I never thought of that. I just never thought of that. Here I am just absorbing in what's the most absorbable area in our entire body and these chemicals are just leaching into my system right there and then. And who, you, you don't think about these things. So again, it's about creating awareness and that's why I had the one slide. Awareness is where it starts. Um, and, and folks, it, it, you, you go away with, uh, uh, from seminars, says, well, doc, he sure is an Eeyore. Um, and, and no, for me, this is empowerment. Uh, I don't like living in a cave. I like the 21st century. I love some of the convenience it gives me, the ability to do research on the, on the fly, right? It's got all these beautiful things about it. But at the same sense, it's also a double-edged sword that can cut us badly, and it is cutting us badly, and it's bankrupting our nation. 
and uh, ruining a generation and it's something that I feel like we need to really get high awareness of. We're seeing things uh, like, like your skin cancers at, at, at I, I never saw skin cancer until, until the last decade. Uh, now I'm seeing them left and right and it is because of all these chemicals that people are exposed to. Um, Right, there's, there's so many, there's, I don't know where to start, it's just an overwhelming wave of things. So we've got to be aware, um, and that empowers us. And I want to also uh, uh, emphasize this one factoid, and that is we want food to remain a joyful experience and not something, oh, I shouldn't be eating this, I shouldn't be eating that, and it becomes our enemy. Temporary, yeah, to figure some things out, right? If somebody's reacting to some things or if they're super inflamed, sure, we'll make it a, some, a very strict program, temporarily. But long term, we want to be able to, to, to have enjoyment out of it. So, so I, I don't want you to go away from this thing as thinking, oh man, I, I, don't know, I don't know where to start. Well, you start with basic common sense, and basic common sense means when you drive out of here, you put your seatbelt on. That alone saves many lives, right? That's common sense. And I, I can go on and on like that. This question, what do you see for our future when I look at our food industry? I, I still see it very grim. We were talking about glycophate. Um, it's all over. It's in the air we breathe. When it rains, we're out in the rain. It's in that, the rainwater. It's absorbing into our skin. Mm -hmm. They're constantly coming out with new genetically engineered foods. What do you see for our future? Like, you know, do you think that we're going to continue getting you know, it, it's, it's, and I can say this as an outsider uh, and having grown up in Europe, right, and all that, and, and I've, I watched America with interest. And, and I, I, I very much consider this my home now, but still I, I got this slightly detached view. And one thing I've noticed about the U.S. is it takes a phenomenal amount of prodding before it goes into action. But once it goes into action, look out. Yeah, it's, it's a little bit the, like Pearl Harbor. Um, I, I know I'm going way off on a tangent here, but, but right, Europe was embroiled in some very nasty situations since 1938, right? And then there's the human atrocities and there's all kinds of threats and, and it took that final prod of Pearl Harbor and we go, oh, maybe we should be involved in World War II, right? And we just converted all of our uh, auto manufacturing industries and in, in within one year, we had this incredibly overpowering army, right? And, and, and it's, it's just an example. And then we went and did what we needed to do. So I think at some point, a tipping point will be reached. I, I really do. I just don't know when. Uh, but I never thought that functional medicine, as we practice it here, would also get, get such credence, right? We get such an overwhelming amount of new patients uh, calling in every week now that we are having to establish a pre-new patient program while they're waiting so that they can at least start engaging with some lifestyle changes, which, which is really a cool program, but it's, it's important. Um, had one actually, uh, an interesting one, uh, so I saw new patients this morning and um, she says, Doc, I've been dealing with severe colitis and uh, uh, incredible diarrhea for over 10 years now and one and a half weeks um, into uh, uh, nourish uh, diet. Uh, thank you, Don. Um, it's her symptoms are completely gone. Just ten days later, just ten days later. It is amazing what you can do just with changing how you eat and lifestyle. What? Yes. Well, water, the water that you get at Meyer, the Culligan water. Yeah. Water. So the Culligan water is it's in plastic uh, or not? We do. Yeah. So. I mean, we'd love to do the glass, but it's just so heavy. It is so heavy. But like artesian water, we ran up to a place and filled the bottles with artesian water. Yeah. Art it's, it's so hard to say. There's this water story is all over the map. Yeah. I just prefer putting a really good filter on my own water. Yeah. That's what I do. What's, what's a really good filter? I knew I was walking into that one. <laughs> Yes. Right. So, so, so there's, there's some, um, the, the best, very inexpensive ones, so going back to being practical here, is Mavea. It, re, it will reduce most, uh, most chemicals by over 90%. Perfect? No. Very inexpensive, yes. Um, even um, the uh, Pure One filter, 
uh, no, zero water. That's what I'm trying to think of. The zero water filters have just made some changes in the past two years. I used to not recommend them. I can recommend them now. They're right on par with Mavea. Brita is not good enough. Um, that's a very commonly asked question. So, so those are the, the inexpensive ones. And then you get into all those big system, all <coughs> water filtration systems. They all have their ups and downs and they're all very expensive. Yeah. Yes. Reverse osmosis is the safest way to safely remove everything. However, you can get um, uh, bacterial contamination because the membrane used in reverse osmosis can get, get bacterial contamination. And you're also making what's called dead water because all, most of the minerals are, are gone. And we need those for a lot of our biochemical processes. So if I were traveling to Mexico, I would love reverse osmosis. <laughs> but living full time here, mm, not so much. I yep. think I do, but I agree minerals. What's that? Water. I have I do yes, and that is one way to do it. Yep. Yep. And the systems that I mentioned do reduce the fluoride, but don't eliminate it altogether. Yeah. I know. You can talk all, all night about this one. Yes. <laughs> Mavea. M A V E A. Zero water was the other one, and there's others too. It's just those are the ones that came to mind. Yes. Okay, MRI heavy metals, great question. So, it is shocking how much contamination that we get from medicine. It is absolutely shocking. And a lot of it also comes from heavy metals actually found in prescription medicines, not just MRI scans. And um, I just saw uh, a statistic, the latest study estimates that we spend $350 billion a year, $350 billion a year on drugs that don't work. It, it's just, to me, that's absolutely mind-boggling. Um, so how do you detoxify these heavy metals? Well, you increase metallothionine. That's that protein that actually binds to the heavy metal while safely upregulating, increasing the speed of detoxification within the liver. So the only one that I've been able to find that does not use intravenous chelation, which I don't really care for because that strips you of all other minerals as well and causes health issues, is using a product called Ultra Clear Renew and metalloclear. Those two combined will safely excrete the heavy metals. We've been doing that here for years and we can verify that with, with independent testing and has been written up in the medical journals. It's a phenomenal system that beats intravenous chelation therapy and um, it also el eliminates pesticides and other things. Yeah. What was the second one? clear. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. What about N-acetylcysteine? NAC. NAC is uh, a big portion of, uh, that's how the uh, Gluteclear works. Uh, Gluteclear is basically N-acetylcysteine. So the question was, how do you, what about N-acetylcysteine? N-acetylcysteine is what we know increases glutathione. NAC for short, by the way. And the question often becomes, well, how much can I use of that? The more, the better. No. Once you go up to 1,000 to 1,500, you're putting the patient into a bit of a detoxification crisis. So this should, you got to use your mind with this one. Um, the only problem with NAC is it's very unstable and we tend to have products that just don't work. And then you'll see, now that I've got you onto this glutathione thing, well, how about the oral glutathione, intravenous glutathione, glutathione patches, or glutathione creams? They don't work. They just don't work. Yeah, their half-life is just, it disappears like that. So it's better to give precursors. It's a wrap. One more. Uh, since metals is such a problem, is there a better cook, uh, um, cooking system that you would recommend rather than... Oh. Don, what are we using for uh, cooking systems now? <laughs> cookware. So cookware, yeah. So, I like cast iron. I do a lot of my own cooking in cast iron. Yep. Yep. And there's also ceramics, uh, new ceramic linings. Uh, they've, they've done a very nice job making it conveniently slippery without the Teflon. Um, Green Pan is a really good brand. Uh, there's others also. Yeah. But Green Pan is one of the ones. And they're very affordable. Yeah. Yeah. Good. I have a lecture I have to go to. Thank you so much for attending. I appreciate that. And. Let's go out there and uh, let's thrive.